Um, and the question that I want to pose tonight is, is the secret to a good life, is the secret to the good life the absence of pain? Is the secret to the good life the absence of pain? I think as Americans and people, we spend a lot of time trying to get rid of any amount of what we see as not good in our lives, right? Like, who in here loves the Chick-fil-A mobile order? Like, do you just, you do it before you get there. If you're not feeling like talking to anybody, you just pop in. Your, your food's waiting for you. It's a beautiful thing. And I think a lot of times, we spend a lot of time trying to minimize that. And I think we, we equate that to our spiritual lives as well. And I think we can, we can point to a number of things. If it, if it weren't for this in my life, I'd have a good life. Like if, it were, if this was gone, things would be better for me. And that could be any number of things. I mean, there's, there's 200 people in this room that would probably say something different for each one of you. That you probably got something that you'd say, man, if it weren't for my family, it would be such a good life. If it weren't for this group of friends that I got with, it would be a good life. If it weren't for fill in the blank, it would be the good life. And that's probably true across this room. There's probably some things that you've done that you'd say, if I could have just gotten rid of this, it would be a good life. If I could not have regret, if I could not have the shame, if I could not have the consequence of that bad decision in seventh grade, in ninth grade, in my senior year of high school, in my freshman year of college, if I could have just not had that relationship, then I would be in a better place in life. If it weren't for this relational tension and confusion and strain, it would be a better life. If it weren't for rejection, if it weren't for sickness, maybe you've got an illness, maybe you've got something that plagues you that you'd say, if this was just gone from my life, things would be good. Maybe you have been so impacted by the death of a loved one that you would say, I, I just, I, I don't know how to move on from this milestone moment in my heart and in my life. I don't know what to do. If it weren't for that, I would have a good life. If it weren't for my money problems, whether it's having too much or having too little, if it weren't for my addiction, if it weren't for my trauma, if it weren't for what that person did to me, if it weren't for the regret of what I did to someone, it would be the good life. Is the good life the absence of pain and difficulty? Well, we're going to look tonight at uh, Paul and something that he said in 2 Corinthians 12. We're also going to look at James 1. If you have your Bibles, you can, you can get there. And I want to ask this question. As I was talking to someone about this message, they said, really, I, it comes down to this. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? And they said, that, that question racked my mind for so long. God, why do you allow pain? In moments of pain for myself, I've sat there and said, God, God, why would you ever let this happen? This person's serving you. This person's good. This person's not done any of the, the big three bad things. Like, they're, they're good. Why are you letting something bad happen to a good person? God, why is there pain? And the first thing that I want to point out tonight is that pain points to a problem. Pain points to a problem. Um, when I first moved to Springfield, I would make these drives back from St. Louis all the way to uh, Springfield. This is a three-hour drive. It's not too bad. But it was just enough time to make the engine on my 93 Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra really heat up. Uh, and one day in, I'm trying to think what year it was. It may have been 2012. The, the transmission on that thing blew in Sullivan, and I spent a couple hours at the Sullivan Walmart waiting for uh, someone to come pick me up from St. Louis. But before I knew that that was going to happen, that car started to have a couple problems. And when it started to have some problems, I, I know a couple things about cars, but I don't know a lot of things. And there was one really, really cold day that I got to my destination. I got to the house that I was staying at in Springfield, and the car was just like acting up. Like you ever just have a, a thing where you're like, the car's doing something different, it's shaking, it's riding different, and you're like, I don't know what's happening, but I believe in God in this moment. And I'm going to pray for this vehicle because I don't know what else to do. And Lord, it's in your hands. I believe in you more this moment than I ever have. And that was one of those moments. And I get out of the car and I pop the hood and I'm like looking around and it's super cold. It's one of those days like what we had a couple weeks ago where it's like single digit cold. I mean, it is cold. And, and I pop up and I'm like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what could be wrong. And eventually I lean into kind of the, the engine compartment and I lean down and I smelled something awful. 
Not like a car smell. And I was like, what in the world? And as I'm leaning down, I start to eventually feel something. And I, w- what had happened was, I, the, the, the car was so hot, my radiator was so hot, but my hand was so cold, I put my hand down on that hot radiator, and because my hand was cold, I didn't feel it for a minute. And I set it down, and what I smelled wasn't my car, it was my hand burning. Yeah. <laughs> And then I started to smell it, and then I started to feel it eventually, and it was just, I mean, it took all the skin off of this hand right here for a couple of weeks. I mean, it was, I probably should have gone to the doctor, did not, we'll get to that later. Um, But it pointed to a problem. The problem was that that thing was too hot, my hand was on it. Pain, right? Pain points to a problem. Pain points to a problem. And before we get started, I want to outline kind of two types of problems that we have, and I think they can interplay together, but I think with young adults, I think we see that there are two types of problems that are really prevalent, and one of them is what we see in James. It's a trial. It's a test. It it doesn't have anything to do with, hey, you did something wrong, so you get this consequence. It's a trial. It's what we see in Job. If you read the story of Job, if you've never read it before, I challenge you to do it, because it's this story where, like, I can't believe it's in the Bible, but Satan comes into God's presence. I don't know what that looks like, but Satan comes into God's presence, and God just starts bragging on this dude, Job. And he's like, my guy, Job, is awesome. He's it. He loves me more than, he's so great. And Satan goes, no, that dude just loves you because you gave him a bunch of stuff. He's really rich. He has a lot of kids. He has a, you blessed him in so many ways. Take some of those blessings away and see if he still says he loves you. And what you see in Job is that he gets these things taken away, and, and He says these incredible things like, man, should I not take good from the Lord, but also bad? And he has these three friends that come and sit with him, and they try to figure out and postulate and say, hey, what could possibly be wrong that this bad is happening to you when you served the Lord your whole life, good things have happened, and now bad is happening? Why? Surely you've done something wrong to get this consequence. And that's not the take. That's not what actually happens. You see the same thing in the life of David. David was serving God. David had been anointed to be the king, but he wasn't in the throne yet. And he was honoring the man who was in the throne named Saul. And Saul had a lot of problems, but he had an anger problem towards David. And he tried to kill him on several occasions, ran away, went from having a wife and good things happening to him to being stuck in a cave. And the king of his country wanted to kill him. Not because he did anything wrong necessarily, but because that's just life. That stuff happens. But the second thing that we see is the consequence of sin. You have a test and a trial, and then you have a consequence of sin. And and listen, this can be any number of things. Even in the story of David, you see how like David's life is impacted by Saul's sin. It wasn't necessarily something that David had done that ended up, but what we know about that and what we see that's true all over the Bible is that sin has a ripple effect. Sin has an effect that, man, it may not be just I sinned against you and that's all. No, it impacts people in generations and friend groups and cultures and all kinds of people and and situations. This sin has a ripple effect. You see it all over the Bible. I mean, the, the first one that you see when Adam and Eve sin, the first ripple that comes out is that they are separated from God. They walked and talked with God in the garden, and it was a beautiful thing what God intended, but they were moved away. And then God said, hey, listen, you, you have this design where you are meant to work, you are meant to live, you are meant to, and that's going to be difficult now. He literally tells Adam, hey, work is going to kill you. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You're going to break the ground for almost nothing. I mean, it's going to be you are eating fruit that I grew for you, and now you have to break the ground to do it. And then he looks at Eve, and he says, you're going to have childbirth. Not an easy thing. Pain is something that is a result of sin. You see it across the Old Testament. You see it in the lives of people like that serve God, Abraham and Moses. They served God, but they also had these kind of black marks on their record where they didn't do everything the way that God intended. Moses was leading God's people through the wilderness because they couldn't quite put things together. And God's telling him how to get water, and he gets angry and throws. Like, he doesn't always do things right. 
even though he's a person that God used. Abraham, same story. He didn't trust God's promises all the way through. That's the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament, and it's just this cycle of we're worshiping God, things are good, things get good. We look at the people next to us, and we go, man, I kind of want what they have. It doesn't look too bad. So you kind of move in with them, and you go, okay, I'll take the things that you have. And then you get there, and you go, man, I like, kind of like the gods that you have too. And they start worshiping those gods too. And then God kind of lets them live in it sometimes. And it's a consequence of their sin. It's until they realize living the way that these people that live next to us live is not worth it. I don't want to do that. God, we need you. And then he sends someone to help them. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it is 52 chapters of God explaining to the Israelites through his prophet Jeremiah, this is what the consequences of sin look like. And it's hard and it's tough. And it's not awesome. But pain points to a problem. So today, whatever your pain might be, I'm sorry that that exists. But it does point to a bigger issue. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians 12 and James 1. And while you're, while you're flipping there, I want you to think through those two people. That when Paul writes this, Paul is a person who has become a good guy, but was not always a good person. Paul was a person who persecuted Christians, who hated the movement of Jesus, and then had his life dramatically changed because of Jesus. And now he's helping people. He's he's sharing the good news of Jesus to people around him. And what we read here is that God still allows pain in his life for a long extended period of time. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, he says, So to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, the things that he knows, the things that he's heard, the things that he gets to do for God, he said, a thorn was given me in the flesh. And when you read that, I've read commentaries all over this, and and no one knows. Because of the language that was used, I mean, he's literally saying, "There, there is a thorn in my side. It is an inability in some way. It's a difficulty in some way. They think that that could have been anything from from, from epilepsy to a speech disorder. I mean, it could be anything. And he, he didn't want to have it, but God gave it to him. It says, a thorn was given me in the flesh. And it, it, it describes it, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And then I want you to flip over and get to James 1. And James, you have to consider what he's getting at when he says this. Now, James is the brother of Jesus. He would have known and walked with Jesus and known who he was. He would have known what his path to the cross looked like. He would have known what it looked like to serve. And this is what he says about pain and difficulty. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. There, the, the first thing that we have to know and we have to just really drill down deep on is understanding that pain is probable. James did not use the term, hey, if. James did not say, hey, under the wrong circumstance, you could find yourself in a shady alley and somebody could. No, he says, hey, brothers, Christians, just because you're following Jesus doesn't mean everything's going to be rosy. In, in fact, when it happens, here's how to prepare for it. And I love the language that he used because he puts that prepositional phrase in front of it and he says, count it all joy. He wants them to understand this is what's important. It is an excitement. It is a thing that you need to do. Why? Is he just a guy who has a a penchant for pain and just loves one of those people that's like, oh man, I love working out because it makes, no, no, no. Y'all are freaks if you like that. That's weird. But he's saying, hey, it fulfills a purpose. And when I say it's probable, I'm not saying it's probable like it might happen. That's my kind way of saying it's going to happen. Pain is going to happen. You might be in a spot right now where you're like, man, pain is pretty evident and I could show it to you. You might be in a spot where you're like, man, things are good and it doesn't seem like pain is around me. Pain is coming. Talk to anybody who's been past the stage where you are in life. There are good things past the stage where you are in life and there are hard things that come with it. There are blessings and there are difficulties. Pain is probable. John 16, 33, I'm not gonna turn there, but I just wanna reference what Jesus is telling his disciples there. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have it. 
And here's the thing that's, that's wild to me about what James says in James 1 verse 2 is that he says, when it happens, consider it joy. Not if, not maybe, when it happens. Guys, I went to the doctor last year. You can hold your applause. I went to the doctor last year. It takes a lot for me to go to the doctor. I have a primary care physician. If you don't, want to, if you don't know what one of those is, you can come talk to me afterwards. I can tell you about the medical system, what I know about it. But a primary care physician went to my doctor because I had a couple of things to talk to him about that weren't going well. And one of them was I was getting my boys out of our minivan. We own a minivan. There's, you guys are learning a lot. Uh, I was getting my kids out of our van. And when I did, there's like a, a hard piece where the track is to, to move the, the seats. And I was leaning down. And I, I leaned down and to get one of my kids out. And I leaned down. I'm taking a shot doing this. And I leaned down to do it. And I thought I had st- like put my knee down on something that was stabbing me. And I was like, okay, something is, is deathly wrong. And I like jumped out of the van. I'm, I'm nursing my knee for a minute. I'm like, Tyler, I think I tore my ACL getting the kids out of the van. Like I'm not much of an athlete, but if that's what it looks like, that's painful. I'll, I'll get back to full strength, but I may not be able to do it in nine months like Adrian Peterson did, but we'll get there. And I, I'm like, Tyler, something. And ever since that moment, I've like gotten down on my knee a couple of times. And it's like, it feels like somebody's shooting a... a an ice pick, a knife up through my kneecap. And I'm like, I gotta talk to the doctor about this. So I get to the doctor, ask about some things. He does the regular physical and I was like, hey, I have a question. And I, t- I was like, hey, this knee right here, um, when, I, when I put weight on it right, right there, it gets, it gets like, it feels, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it feels like some, something's burning me. Um, so if you could take a look at it. And he kind of smiled and he goes, yeah. Um, and he, he grabbed it, and he did that thing where he like put it on the edge of the table, and he did one of these, and he made sure I could kick, and he was like, okay. And I was like, ACL, MCL, like, what are, what are we working with? Like, how long is my rehab? Like, what are, what are we working at? And he goes, how old are you? And I said, 29. And he goes, that happens. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I don't think you understand. Like, can you check? Will you sh- check my ACL and my MCL and all the CLs that I don't know about? Like, will you make sure that I'm okay? And he was like, I'll check for you. And he, he checked and he showed me. He goes, you wouldn't be able to do this. You wouldn't be able to do this. He goes, part of that is just getting older. <laughs> That's awful. That's not what I wanted to hear. And then he explained to me, he's a guy in his 50s. He goes, yeah, I have this little pad that I carry around with me around the house. And I have to get down on my knees. I just put that pad down. And I was like, guys, I'm getting old. Like, this is awful. It's not fun. (sighs) But what you know is that this world is broken. It's not right. It's not what it was intended to be. This world has its own set of issues. Our bodies, our relationships, our relationship to God is not what it should have been. And our pain points us to that problem. And Paul takes that and says, sorry, James takes that and says, consider it joy. I left that doctor's appointment thinking that I was going to die soon. And here's James saying, hey, consider it joy. Why in the world would anybody consider it joy? And I think we see a piece of that mirrored from what James says to what Paul is living in 2 Corinthians. Look at verse 8. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Our pain should lead us to a place of pleading with God. Your pain is going to make you wonder. Your pain is going to make you go, why is that happening? When I put my hand down on the radiator of my car, it made me say, why did I do that? What's happening? Why would anybody make a part in a car that could get that hot? Why does my knee hurt the way that it does? Pain leads us to a place of pleading. And what we see here is that Paul pleaded with God to take it away. If you're in the middle of pain, it is not wrong to ask God to take it away. Not at all. But I think that gets to why it's a joy. Because in our, joy, in our pain, God is producing something in us. 
In our pain, God is producing faith. I mentioned David at the beginning of my message, and man, I love to read Psalms because sometimes I think I can live in my head, and my mental health may not be good, and I don't know what I'm getting at half the time, and I confuse myself, and I don't know how to take a certain situation. And you read Psalms, and you're like, David had some conflicting thoughts. But I think the redeeming quality of David was that he didn't take these, redeem, these, these conflicting thoughts and take him to one of his good buddies. Now, it's not wrong to do that. David didn't take his conflicting thoughts and let them live in his head until they blew up somewhere out of anger. David took his conflicting thoughts to God. David took his conflicting thoughts, and you read through Psalms, and there's time that he says, why, God, why does this happen? Why are you allowing the people that are evil seem like they do so well? And then it's like he changes the, his, his tense, and he, and he talks about how, God, you've allowed me to think this because it brought me to a place of needing you. And in that pleading, I think it shows us what we can let go of. Three L words for pleading. It forces us to look at God. God, what, even in your questioning, God smiles at you because he so loves that you run to him in a moment of questioning. You look to him. And the second thing is that you listen. You're going to plead. You're going to make your case to God. Absolutely. But we also listen. God, what? Why? And then listen. God, what do you have for me? Why did this happen? Because sometimes we can have an event that we brought upon ourselves. We've isolated ourselves from people. We, we've not been held in community. We've not been with people. And then we go, God, why do I feel alone? Well, Let's look to God, and then let's listen. Wise counsel can help that. Wise counsel will make that make sense. Understanding God's plan for you in your life will help it make sense. But the last L is to loosen. Because sometimes in our pain, and this is what happens physically and physio physiologically, is that when you're in pain, you move. I mean, there's adrenaline that starts pumping immediately. When you're in pain, you, you, you make movements. And what happens in moments of pain and moments of great fear is that you realize what's really, really important. There's a reason that your body starts to get tunnel vision when you start to black out so that you can, you can focus on the things that are important. I don't know if you've ever been through a tragedy or a difficulty in your family, but when you have someone that you think is going to die, when you have someone who's deathly sick, when you have someone who you think, it's like everything else, it's like, I, I, it's not a loosening, it's a throwing, it's, it doesn't matter anymore. And I think we have to view this as a gift. And I know if you're sitting here and you're in pain today, it doesn't sound like a gift. Pain never sounds like a gift. But if it forces us to run to and look to our creator and our savior and our redeemer, it is a gift. I was listening to Ben Stewart talk about this and he says that most of your heroes are most likely people that have been through great pain. There's a reason. God's doing something to loosen things for us. I think about, uh, I was an economics major at Missouri State, and one of the principles that they talked about, they talked about the greatest generation. This was probably like our grandparents or their parents' generation. This was the generation that fought in World War II, that was around for some of those those battles, and, and you know, even if you were at home, you were rationing, you were working, it, it was just a different generation. And one of, one of the reasons that it's a principle in economics is that they, they talk about it in a way that says, if you've been through something difficult, God is preparing you for something great on the other side of it. 
Now, that's the, the spiritual impact of it. The economic impact of it is when, when you were 18, 19, 20, 22 years old, and you had to go to Europe and fight for freedom and fight for your life and fight for your way of living, and then you went home, I mean, starting a business wasn't anything. I mean, working hard at your job, I'm just glad nobody's shooting at me. I'm glad there's not planes flying overhead that are dropping bombs. I'm glad there's not a tank coming at me. So they worked hard. They did what was in front of them. But in pain and in difficulty, God can be preparing us for something incredible. If we see it as a gift. The last thing is that pain produces faith. Pain produces faith. We see that in verse 9 and 10, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. He pleaded with God three times to take it away. In verse 9 he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient. It's enough for you. Even if the thorn still stays in place, my grace is enough. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, so therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weakness, with insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Pain produces faith. James mirrors that in what he says, and he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Steadfastness is the ability to stay steady and forward and moving, even though things are happening around you. It's not just walking with purpose. It's the idea that the bombs are going off, arrows are coming at you, and you are able to walk towards God. That in him growing your faith, it grows your steadfastness. To me, I look at people that are in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, people that have been through incredibly hard things, that have had difficult family things happen, difficult financial things happen. I said, how do you do it in the moment? You don't know what it is. But it's an opportunity to look and listen and loosen your grip and become steadfast. And it puts everything else in perspective. That next verse in in James says a lot, and it says, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. That last picture, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Our our goal as believers is to to show the world a clear representation, a clear picture of who God is. But there's a, a word before steadfastness that's really important. He says, and let steadfastness have its full effect. Because here's the reality. Some of us in this room right now are going through something difficult and are going through something hard, but we are not letting steadfastness come to its full effect. What does that look like? That looks like I'm angry that I'm hurt, and I'm just going to complain about it. God, how could you? And then shut down the conversation with God. God, I would never do that if I was God. We get cynical and we get bitter and we don't let this steadfastness grow in us. We don't let faith grow because of our pain. We shut it down, we nip it, and we stop it and we say, no, I don't want pain to grow me. I don't, wa- I don't care about any of that. I want the easiest life that I can possibly have. And I talked earlier about people that, man, you're, you're working out and you love it, that that's a freak. There's also people that work out because they know that it's going to help them. And this is the picture that Paul gives us. This is the picture that James gives us. It's this breaking down of your muscle so that you can do more later. It's this doing something difficult so that you can do something greater later. 
We have to do this with our kids all the time. I had to sit down with my five-year-old son and start teaching him how to read. Boy, didn't know what a letter was. And he's sitting there and he gets frustrated. He doesn't want to do it. And why would, but now he can read words and it's going through the difficulty so that you can have the greater thing happen later. And I think some of us ended up with a, a stunted Christian life because we hate the pain that God allows into our lives, the pain that God gives us into our lives, instead of what Paul says where he says, I'm going to boast in my weakness. Because in Paul's economy, it's not Paul that figured it out. It's not Paul that said, man, I went from somebody who was persecuting Christians to somebody who's really good for them now. He said, it's Jesus. I got in the way. So he says, I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm going to boast in my abilities. I'm going to boast. I'm going to say, hey, this is what I bring to the table. And God is good in spite of it. How good is that? That he's worth following. So what's our weakness? What do we all have? What do we all carry with us? What's that thing? When you read through Romans, you can't help but see it. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God's standard is perfection. God's standard is perfect. And we fall short of that. So when we bring anything, it could be something that we think is great, it's just not the standard of God. It's the analogy of saying, like, man, I'm pretty decent at basketball. I think I could take most of the people in this room. And then LeBron James enters. It's like, okay, uh, let me rephrase it. I could take some of the people in this room. God's standard is so much higher and greater than we could ever imagine. So when we ask the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? There are not good people. I think about myself and I go, I'm not, I'm not good. I know the things that I think, I know the things that I would love to do, but God is so good to me. In spite of the evil and the bad that I bring to the table, he says, I will still love you. I will still redeem you. I will still save you. Will you let me sit in the throne of your heart? And then I want to go, okay, God, if you could shove off just a little bit so I could have some, no, he's the ultimate good. He's the ultimate authority. Does God have that seat in your heart and in your life? Is that the way that you view pain? What's your approach to pain? What does it look like? Um, I was with a family member uh, that's a cattle farmer in southeast Missouri, and uh, he was telling us about, he had, for about two years, he had this, this sickness, and he didn't know what it was. He thought it was Lyme disease. He thought it was some different things. And he would just get really weak and really tired. And he was going through some stuff with his parents that were still there working on the farm with him. It's very physical, manual labor. And he was going, I couldn't just not work the farm because of this sickness. So I I just powered through it, did what I could. But he said, it got to a certain point where I just couldn't do it anymore. And he said, I had to go to the doctor. Might be a family trait. We'll figure it out. But he said, I had to go to the doctor. And they started to figure out some of the things that were wrong and started to, to help him. But I remember we sat there and he said, man, I just, I had to stop and remember. All this has got an answer. And he said, that same morning I went to the doctor, I was was reading my, my regular Bible in the morning. And he said, I read Revelation 21, second to last chapter in the Bible. And he said, those first seven verses gave me peace, even though I still had pain. That pain is not completely gone for him. And then he quoted this. This is what he said. He said, this is the end of the book. And if you're in pain right now, know that pain has its end. And this is what is said. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, The dwelling place of God is with man. Did you know that? Did you know that the dwelling place of God who created you, who loves you deeper than any person could ever fathom, his place is with you. 
He will dwell with him and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Did you know that? Did you know that there's going to come a time when the king who sits on the throne will make all right, all wrong things right. He will wipe away every tear. He will wipe away every pain. He will make things right. And he wants to be with you, not just then, but now. now I want to ask you, does that king sit on the throne of your heart? Or is it the king of comfort? Is it the king of something else? Is this king that we just read about, the one who sits on your the throne of your heart? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, and I want you to ask that question of yourself. Ask it with God right now. God, do you sit on the throne of my heart, or is it something else? Because if God sits on the throne of your heart, we have the opportunity to look at our pain and look at the things that are happening in our life that may not be ideal, and we get to say, God's doing something in me. God's growing me. God's growing my faith. God wants me to become new. This is what his plan is. And guess what? He's going to fix it. That's God. Does he sit on the throne of your heart? If you're here today and you say, that's not me, and I know I need to do that, will you just slip your hand up and look at me? I know I need Jesus to sit on the throne of my heart. It's simple. How to give God that throne. You you have to admit, God, I've been sitting in my own throne. God, I've been calling my own shots. God, I've been doing whatever it takes to make it look like the good life from from myself. But God, right now, I'm going to step out of that. And I'm going to let you sit on that throne because you are ultimately good. And I'm not. And God, I want to live every day from here until the end of eternity. There is no end with you sitting on that throne because you're good. And if you've done that, there's no greater thing for you to do in life. We're going to have a time of response. We're going to have some people down front that would love to pray with you, whether you're telling them about your faith for the first time, or you're just saying, I've got some pain that I need, to, I need to look in the right direction. I need to listen to him, and I need to loosen my grip on some things. Man, come and pray. Come and respond to God now. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing, and it's going to be a time of response that we get to have towards this God. God, we love you. God, I'm thankful that this is how good you really are. God, that your response to pain is not to see us from far off and say, I hope it gets better. I hope they figure it out. But God, you came to us. God, it's so personal. We don't deserve that level of intimacy with you, but it's what you give us. God, you're so good. Hey God, right now I pray that this would be a place of response where we would see our pain as a joy, where we would see you as the utmost authority and good in our hearts and in our lives. God, we love you in your holy name. Amen.